Welcome to this educational activity entitled Clinical Profiles in Severe Eosinophilic Asthma. This is a non-promotional, non-CME disease state educational program brought to you by CHEST in collaboration with and sponsored by GlaxoSmithKline. I'm Nick Hanania. I'm a social professor of medicine in pulmonary critical care and director of the Airway Clinical Research Center and interim chief of pulmonary critical care at Bentob Hospital in Houston. And with me, it's my pleasure to introduce my co-moderator, Dr. Linda Rogers, who's Associate Professor of Medicine in Pulmonary Critical Care and Sleep Medicine at Mount Sinai National Jewish Respiratory Institute in New York. Welcome, Linda. Welcome, Nick. I'm glad to be doing this program with you. Same here. It's always a pleasure. So our focus today is to talk about... Uh, it's a disease state program to talk about eosinophilic asthma and severe eosinophilic asthma. Uh, we have three uh, sections in this program, case-based discussions, but initially I would like to start with some few introductory slides. We know asthma continues to be uh, a big problem throughout the world. Uncontrolled asthma is very common, actually not shown in this slide, but it accounts for about 50% of patients with asthma out there. This slide really reminds us that there are differences between what we call uncontrolled asthma and severe asthma. Certainly they can be interchangeable in some situations, but not in all. Out of all uncontrolled asthma, about five to 10% of patients have severe asthma. Therefore, how do we define severe asthma? As you see on this slide, it is defined as asthma that remains uncontrolled despite need for high dose inhaled corticosteroids and another controller or asthma that requires high dose inhaled corticosteroid and another controller to prevent it from being uncontrolled asthma. In addition, asthma that requires oral steroid therapy on a long-term basis is also defined as severe asthma. Now that's obviously in the context of uncontrolled disease when everything else has been checked off, including adherence to therapy, triggers, treatment of comorbidities, use of inhaler devices. As you see on the right side of the screen, uncontrolled asthma continues to be a very important risk factor for exacerbation and progressive decline in lung function. Often, as I mentioned, severe asthmatics can have uncontrolled asthma, but that is not to say that all severe asthma patients cannot be controlled. And indeed, there are several ways we can control these patients. However, among severe patients with asthma, about 20% of so are considered to have uncontrolled disease. So over the years, our thoughts of asthma have changed. In fact, in now in the year 2021 and go, going forward, we are thinking about this old disease in a different way. For many, many years, we thought this is a disease that has one size that is fits all. And indeed, for many years, we approached this disease as a one phase disease. Now we come to realize both from the clinical aspect, from the triggers, from even the inflammatory aspect, this asthma is a heterogeneous disease. Indeed, uh, clinically, we see patients with mild disease, moderate disease, we see late onset asthma, early onset asthma, we see allergic triggered asthma, we see late onset non-allergic asthma, and there are certain subtypes, what we call phenotypes, that may affect treatment and management strategies for this disease. More lately, we are now defining asthma based on the mechanism of airway inflammation that occurs in this disease, i.e. what we call endotypes. And as you see on the right side of the slide, we have several endotypes that we have now seen, and that's based on bronchoscopy evidence, sputum, testing, uh, other, other biomarker testing, we know that eosinophilic asthma is a major uh, component of uh, asthma in general, particularly severe asthma. There are neutrophilic asthmatics, there are patients with airway inflammation with asthma that don't have uh, neutrophilia or have mixed type of inflammation. Well, inflammation in asthma is certainly heterogeneous too. For many years, we sort of focused on one type of inflammation, which is a very common type, and that's called T2 high asthma, or in the past, we used to call it TH2 asthma. And as you see on the left side of the screen, uh, TH2 asthma now is now recalled as T2 asthma. 
T2 asthma is driven by either an adaptive immune response, which usually is triggered by allergens handled by the Th2 cells, as you see here, or through innate immune system, where this trigger is usually due to other non-allergic triggers, pollutant, smoke exposure, microbial exposure, or other exposures that trigger the very similar downstream signal, uh, but is triggered by innate lymphocyte C2 cells and others. And you can see the profile or cytokine profile of this type of asthma is very similar, where it's triggered by what we call T2 cytokines, including the IL-4, IL-5, IL-13, and inflammatory cells, including eosinophils, mast cells, and obviously other uh, cytokines that are seen on the slide. So that's the most common type of asthma we have, type 2 high asthma. On the other hand, we have non-type 2 asthma, as shown on the right side of the screen, that is usually triggered by non-allergic triggers. And inflammatory-wise, it is triggered by inflammatory cells that are not seen in type 2 asthma, most often neutrophils and other cytokines such as uh, IL-17, IL-8, uh, rather than the T2 cytokines. The bottom line, inflammation and asthma is very common. Uh, certainly, it is a heterogeneous. The majority of asthmatics have T2 high asthma. The eosinophils play a major role in this type of asthma, which is the focus of today's discussion. Now, how is that related to what I should do in my clinic? When I see an uncontrolled patient with asthma who comes to me, uh, how do I define T2 inflammation? Well, Gina, in their latest reiteration, uh, defined T2 inflammation based on biomarker profile of the patient. High blood eosinophils, more than 150 cells per cubic liter, or high pheno, more than 20 parts per billion, high sputum eosinophils, or asthma that is clinically allergen-driven or allergen-triggered, or the presence of high, blood, high uh, or need for chronic oral steroids. So this is the type two asthma sort of definition based on biomarker profile, and of course, a clinical presentation. So the focus of today's discussion is gonna be on eosinophilic asthma, a major subtype of T2 high asthma. Why is in first? Because they are very important cells that drive the disease, particularly T2 high in inflammation or T2 asthma. We know that eosinophils are brought from the bone marrow to the airway through different mechanisms, particularly through a, a cytokine called interleukin-5. Interleukin-5 is an important cytokine that signals the recruitment of eosinophils to the airway, but also promotes the maturation of eosinophils and also prevents the the death of eosinophils. So for, it's a very important cytokine uh, for eosinophilic asthma. As you will hear from me and from Dr. Rogers, we will present to you a few clinical scenarios where severe eosinophilic asthma present to us. And although we're not gonna dig deep into the management, I think it is very important to understand the pathophysiologic mechanism, the clinical presentation so that you Therefore, next, uh, the next step, take a step to appropriate management. So with that introductory slides, I would like to turn it over to my colleague, Linda Rogers, who is going to really walk us through, uh, through a case scenario, uh, how to identify severe eosinophilic asthma uh, in the year 2021 and what we have learned. Linda, the floor is yours. Please go ahead. Great, Nick. Thank you so much um, for that great introduction. And so let's take some of that uh, great introduction that Dr. Hanania just presented to us and see how we can make that uh, uh, relevant to what you all see in your clinical practices. And so uh, this is our first patient in our first case. This is Olivia, who has severe eosinophilic asthma. And so let's tell you a little bit about Olivia. She is 50 years old. Um, she's five feet, six inches and 174 pounds and has had asthma for quite some time, almost 20 years now with an adult onset diagnosis at age 30. Um, she has um, very difficult to treat asthma. She's had three exacerbations treated with oral corticosteroids in the past year. And she reports intermittent dyspnea and wheezing on most days. 
uh, waking at night at least once a week on average, um, with asthma triggers being upper respiratory infections, uh, strong odors and fumes and exertion. And on her asthma control test, she scored 16 out of 25, which is indicative of uh, uncontrolled asthma. She's being treated with a high dose inhaled corticosteroid and long acting beta agonist, um, and is using her short acting beta agonist on most days, at least twice daily. So you do a little bit of an assessment. Um, you obtain some uh, blood work and allergy testing and her complete blood count with differential reveals an absolute uh, bloody eosinophil count of 420 cells per microliter, which is quite elevated. Her total IgE is a 35, um, but her allergen skin prick tests are negative and she has mild obstruction on spirometry. Next slide, please. So what are the characteristics of severe asthma and uh, what are the characteristics of severe eosinophilic asthma? So, you know, first of all, about five to 10% of all asthma patients have severe asthma. And depending on the criteria one uses, up to 84% of patients with severe asthma will have evidence of eosinophilic inflammation. So severe eosinophilic asthma, a subset of severe asthma is characterized by persistent eosinophilia driven either, as Dr. Hanania pointed out earlier, by allergic or non-allergic triggers. And the eosinophil cutoffs um, can be easily obtained um, using basic blood work available to most providers. And a cutoff of 150 cells uh, per microliter or more uh, corresponds very nicely with uh, a group of patients who are potentially responders to targeted biological therapies, uh, which target uh, type two or eosinophilic inflammation. So what are the clinical characteristics of these patients? How do they present in our practice? And so these patients often have significant air, persistent airflow limitation and a significant number of exacerbations. Although this uh, presentation can present at any age, more commonly these patients have late onset disease, often in adulthood, and it's common for them to have chronic rhinosinusitis with or without nasal polyposis. And so prevalent sinus disease and prominent sinus symptoms often travel hand in hand with their severe asthma. And that includes a subtype of patients with chronic rhinosinusitis and asthma, uh, which are those patients who have aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease. And there are biomarkers also that are a clue to the presence of this phenotype. And that can include increased sputum eosinophil counts if you are at a center that does a sputum induction as part of your evaluation. Uh, more commonly, we are looking at this in the blood eosinophil counts and these patients may have increased exhaled nitric oxide levels as well. And so what are the role of eosinophils in asthma pathogenesis? So eosinophils are commonly recruited to the airways um, during asthma, and they play an important role in multiple asthma phenotypes. And as alluded to earlier um, by Dr. Hanania, there is an allergic uh, phenotype where uh, 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 alarmins, which you can see at the top of the slide on the epithelial surface, are produced, and those include IL-25, 33, and something called thymic stromal lymphopoietin. And those orchestrate an adaptive immune response, including Th2 cells, um, with recruitment of B cells, class switching for production of IgE, uh, which cross-links uh, mast cells and basophils and, and really results in the early and late allergic response that most of us are familiar with. And eosinophils are part and parcel of the airway inflammation that is generated in allergic asthma. But um, we also have eosinophils playing a cardinal role in our uh, uh, non-allergic asthma types. And those uh, uh, patients can have disease triggered by the presence of irritants, infections, uh, air pollution, and other non-allergic triggers. Um, many of the same alarmins are involved in this process as highlighted in the allergic uh, group of patients. However, this pathway goes through the um, innate immune system uh, with a prominent feature of innate lymphoid cells, but a similar pattern of cytokine production, including IL-4, 5, and 13, which is the uh, are the cardinal cytokines involved in the type 2 inflammatory response, and eosinophils are very much in the center of all of this. And so our subtypes you can see here are allergic, allergic eosinophilic asthma, non-allergic eosinophilic asthma, and then asthma that is posse-inflammatory or neutrophilic asthma, which is a type 2 low uh, phenotype. 
And so um, eosinophils are also central to many of the features of disease, and uh, they are central to airway hyperresponsiveness. They can be involved in recruitment um, of release of leukotrienes and histamine, which are involved in airway hyperresponsiveness, production of interleukin-13, which is central to the mucus production in goblet cells, production of uh, proteins such as major, major basic protein and eosinophil peroxidase, which are involved in uh, epithelial uh, tissue damage um, and uh, recruitment of other mediators such as basophils to the airways and uh, 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 stimulation of the extracellular matrix via TGBF and uh, with uh, airway remodeling. And blood eosinophils are important um, in terms of uh, risk events related to asthma. So you can see here in this study by Price et al. from the Lancet in 2015, that above the level of 200 cells per microliter, every 100 cell per microliter increase in eosinophil count is linearly associated with increased risk of asthma exacerbation. Moreover, the same levels are increased in uh, increased likelihood of poor asthma control. Um, so there is a linear response between eosinophil count and both risk and asthma control. And that threshold starts above 100 to 150 cells per microliter. In the general population, we see usually a count of 100 cells per microliter or less for context. However, you have to be careful in obtaining and interpreting blood eosinophil counts because there are a number of factors that can affect eosinophil levels, including diurnal variation, seasonality, comorbidities, and concomitant oral corticosteroid use. And so obtaining eosinophil counts while on oral corticosteroids can mask the presence of eosinophilic inflammation. And so it is important to check uh, ideally when uh, patients are not on oral corticosteroids. In one study of biological therapy evaluating the placebo patients in a clinical trial, about 65% of patients on medium to high dose inhaled steroid, corticosteroids, and long acting beta agonists shifted their eosinophil category over a 12 month period. About 70% of patients who at one measurement had an eosinophil count less than 150 cells per microliter had a count over 150 cells per microliter during a 12 month evaluation, highlighting the variability of this measure. And in patients with severe asthma who continue to exacerbate on standard of care, that threshold of 150 cells per microliter or greater is a marker um, of airway eosinophilia and potential for eligibility of advanced therapies. So repeated measurements may be possible at least three times before assuming a patient is type 2 low rather than having eosinophilic inflammatory profile. So these patients with eosinophilic asthma have a number of outcomes uh, that are worse than many other patients with asthma. They tend to have more severe airflow limitation. They tend to have greater airway hyperresponsiveness, increased airway remodeling, increased goblet cell and mucus hyperplasia, uh, membrane thickening and fibrosis from deposition of extracellular matrix as highlighted in the earlier mechanistic slides, and airway smooth muscle hypertrophy. All of this corresponds with poor symptom control, increased risk of exacerbations, um, including hospitalizations. And so here are, are the most recent GINA guidelines for asthma therapy. And I'm not gonna focus for the moment on step therapies one through four, as this is not the, really the focus of this presentation. We're gonna really focus on step five. And you can see here in step five, once a patient is not achieving control, on medium to high dose inhaled corticosteroid and a second controller, which is often but not exclusively a long acting beta agonist, we are usually adding on additional therapies and those can include drugs like a long acting muscarinic. But for patients having more than two exacerbations per year and patients with an eosinophilic phenotype, we're often adding on a biological therapy and that may include anti-IgE monoclonal antibody, um, anti-IL-5 therapies, which can include both cytokine blockers and receptor antagonists for the anti-IL-5 pathway, and anti-IL-4 receptor alpha therapies um, for add-on therapy. So what are the next steps for our patient getting back to Olivia? So 
Um, I'd like to highlight some next steps and what I would do in my evaluation of Olivia and some take home points. So first and foremost, we must always verify that the patient is adhering to appropriate therapy and using correct inhaler technique. We may prescribe therapy, but we wanna make sure the patient's actually getting it and getting it with correct technique before we assume that a patient needs a higher level of therapy. We also want to attempt to minimize oral corticosteroid use over time um, by making sure that they're on maximal ideal inhaled therapy by modifying triggers and treating comorbidities. And once we've done all of those things, if a patient is not achieving the goals of therapy, we may want to consider escalating therapy if we have evidence of eosinophilic asthma. So to highlight some take-home points from Olivia's case, First of all, the phenotype should be assessed in patients with persistent symptoms and exacerbations despite high-dose ICS lab use. Between 74 to 84% of patients with severe asthma may have an eosinophilic phenotype. Biomarkers can sometimes be helpful in assessing patients for eosinophilic asthma, but a single measurement may not be sufficient to diagnose or manage eosinophilic asthma. And in severe asthma, high eosinophil counts correlate with increased severity poor asthma control and worse outcomes, including exacerbations. So- Linda, that was great. Um, go ahead. Yes, thank you, Nick. Um, so, um, you know, I, you know, as we go through this and we think about our patient Olivia, it really makes me think about how specialists like us uh, evaluate eosinophilic asthma in our practice. So first, maybe if you can comment a little bit on how you phenotype patients in your practice, and then maybe we can talk about how to do that outside of a severe asthma program, like the programs that we're involved in. Yeah, thank you for the question, Linda, and for really setting the stage for this discussion. You know, as I mentioned in my introductory slides, we really do have a, we're thinking outside the box now when we approach severe asthma. And certainly it was by demand that we had to think that way because we know not all patients behave similarly. So I look at the clinical presentation. So I certainly like to look at, uh, you know, how long has the asthma been? Is it allergic triggered by history? Does the patient have, we'll talk about comorbidities in the next section. I always ask about allergic comorbidities, allergic symptoms. Uh, when did it start? Uh, exposures. I have a lot of patients who smoke and they have smoke-related asthma. And I've certainly, after looking at the lung function, I do look at biomarkers. Now it's a standard of care in my practice. But again, I run a severe asthma clinic to look at biomarkers, particularly blood eosinophils, but I'll also measure total, total IgE, allergen-specific IgE, and also pheno. In some patients, at least, I'm trying to do more and more uh, measurement of these biomarkers to try to subtype these patients. But I have to admit, numbers, only one-time numbers, as you mentioned, it's very important to keep or have this cognitive uh, in cognition in our brains that a one-time number may not tell you the whole story. You have to look at the clinical presentation and occasionally these biomarkers have to be repeated, uh, especially if patients have been on oral steroids that had just come out of the hospital. Uh, you cannot just depend on one measurement. In fact, Gina suggests measuring them three times. You can go back to the chart and see historically what they have done with previous blood eosinophil counts. And if it's measured, most of the time, these patients have, must have had a, a CBC with differential done in the previous years. Uh, and of course, I look at, uh, at, at, at physiology, at lung function, uh, to, to decide on whether the patient has airway obstruction, how bad it is, and, and so on. Yeah, I mean, that's very similar, which I would expect because we both work in severe asthma programs. We do do exhaled nitric oxide, pheno on most of our patients. But I think for people out there in the community who either don't have uh, exhaled nitric oxide testing in their practice, really, uh, you know, two of the key things that you just mentioned that we can do in most practices is, you know, blood allergy testing, IgE levels, and a, and a blood eosinophil count optimally off of steroids. And so I think this uh, type of evaluation can be done in, in most community practices, at least on a, a preliminary level for most patients. Yeah, and, and I think in, one has to keep, keep in mind that also blood eosinophils can be uh, variable between one day to the other in the same patient. There are some diseases that may mimic or cause high eosinophils. Luckily in the US, we don't have lots of parasitic infections, but in some countries, other causes may be causing the eosinophilia. So one has to always be um, 
with ha- with eyes open to to make sure that the eosinophilia is due to the asthma itself and not something else. Yeah. Yes, agreed on all counts. <laughs> I'm glad we are. Uh, you know, I think I think it's a really a, a game changer in asthma where we now have biomarkers. Uh, more to come. Obviously, the, the talk about maybe composite biomarkers in the future that maybe we should look at more than one thing to even subdivide this pie more and, and may, maybe lead to a more precise approach for the disease. I think it's uh, it's just the beginning right now, and I'm glad we are there because that really permitted us to to hopefully personalize the approach for this disease. Yes. Okay, well, maybe we can go on with the next uh, section. Uh, I'm going to be addressing comorbidities. And, and certainly severe eosinophilic asthma is, uh, is a disease that we, 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 we have to face with other, uh, where patients may have other comorbidities. Uh, as I always teach my fellows, uh, you know, as pulmonologists, we always focus on the lung, but indeed, we really have to have an open mind because especially when it comes to asthma, where comorbidities not only can coexist, but can actually affect the course of the disease. Let me sh- start with a case, uh, just like uh, Linda mentioned uh, her case. This is Zach. Uh, he has a severe eosinophilic asthma. Uh, but also comes to us because he has uncontrolled disease. Uh, he's, uh, as opposed to the first case, this patient has late onset asthma. Uh, his asthma started at the age 26. He's 48 right now. Uh, he uh, is, has been treated with uh, high dose inhaled steroid, long acting beta agonist, and leukotriene modifier. Unfortunately, his asthma continued to be uncontrolled to the extent that he's now being on, is taking oral steroid on a regular basis. And uh, he's using also his short acting beta agonist. He reports exacerbations treated with oral corticosteroid burst at least two in the past year uh, and continues to have symptoms of dyspnea, night awakening. Uh, he's gained weight because of the prednisone and his ACT score is, depicts uncontrolled disease, which is 17. Notably, this patient doesn't just have asthma. He has other things. He has nasal symptoms. He has been diagnosed with chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps. He has GERD, and he has obstructive sleep apnea. All three comorbidities are very important that we'll talk about in a minute in, uh, in maybe affecting the control of the disease. And as you see here, his CBC and differential uh, shows the, that the xenophilic count is 466. Um, he's non-allergic, and his lung function shows airway obstruction. So this is not an this is not an uncommon scenario in a pulmonary practice where patients with severe asthma are referred. Uh, he's an oral steroid dependent asthma, so this opens up the doors of even more complicated patients. Uh, but also he has other comorbidities. So when we talk about comorbidities of asthma, there are quite a few. This is actually a short list of a long, much longer list. One has to keep in mind that severe asthma is more frequently associated with comorbid diseases compared with less severe asthma. And these could be pulmonary comorbidities, but non-pulmonary comorbidities. When it comes to severe isonophilic asthma, certainly respiratory comorbidities, especially upper airway comorbidities, are very common, including allergic and uh, rhinitis, uh, including chronic rhinosinusitis with or without nasal polyps. But there are others, uh, uh, respiratory, uh, non-respiratory or respiratory disease that can cause uh, or be coexistent with asthma. Sleep apnea is a big one. Aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease, which may or may not be associated with nasal polyposis. Uh, GERD uh, and obviously depression, anxiety uh, are only a few of these. Comorbid. So it's very important when one approaches severe asthma to go through all these uh, by history uh, and make sure they, you address these comorbidities. When it comes to eosinophilic comorbidities, the, it, it's also a wide spectrum and it, you don't have to see them all in patients with severe eosinophilic asthma, but often you may see them or you, they may be the presenting, uh, the presentation is gonna be asthma, but the, these patients may have other uh, eosinophilic diseases, particularly uh, EGPA, for example, uh, is granulomatosis with polyangiitis. 
previously called Shirk Strauss syndrome. Uh, it can present with severe asthma, eosinophilia, pulmonary infiltrates, and sometimes vasculitic changes. So one has to keep that in mind uh, when you see eosinophilia and asthma. Rhinitis is another uh, uh, eosinophilic comorbidity, certain nasal polyposis, uh, which could be triggered by aspirin exacerbation, but it should, could be non, uh, triggered by, uh, by non-allergic mechanisms. Uh, ABPA, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, often presenting with eosinophilic asthma, although usually the IgE level is very high, and many of these patients have bronchiectasis on CT scan and maybe pulmonary infiltrates. Uh, eosinophilic gastroenteritis, very rare, but often uh, a, a problematic patient, some of these patients, especially if they present with a uh, swallowing problem or uh, esophageal problem. And then there are other rarer diseases, uh, eosinophilic pneumonia and um, eosinophilic COPD certainly is something that now we are starting to look at uh, because for many years we thought COPD is just an eneutrophilic uh, disease, uh, but in fact about 20% of patients with, with COPD may have significant eosinophilia. So let's concentrate on at least a couple of these comorbidities that are very important that this gentleman has or may have. He presents with chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyposis. Well, what do we know about this? About 15 to 40 percent of severe asthma patients reports to have chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps. I always teach my, my residents and fellows that treating asthma starts with the nose. It's very, very important that the respiratory tract exam starts with the nose. Uh, in fact, rhinoscopy is very important. Uh, asking the patient if they have nasal symptoms is very important, but occasionally radiologic uh, uh, testing, CT sinuses and others. And of course, working with uh, our colleagues, the ENT colleagues is very important if that is uh, a coexisting comorbidities. Why? Because as many patients have a higher uh, severity and frequency of chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyp than non-asthmatic individuals. And in fact, having comorbid CRS with nasal polyp and asthma uh, has poor outcomes in both uh, the sinus symptoms, but also in the asthma um, uh, mortality, but also asthma morbidity and quality of life. So management of patients with CRS with nasal polyp and asthma should include targeting both diseases. Otherwise, the outcomes will not be optimal. And in another subtype of patients where they may present with eosinophilic asthma, often with also uh, chronic rhinosinusitis with, with, with nasal polyps, are uh, patients with aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease. Uh, it is, does not have to be aspirin, it could be a non steroidal agent. Uh, the intolerance to aspirin or non-steroidal agents may be subtle. It may not be reported by the patient, but patients who present with a triad of asthma, nasal polyps, and aspirin sensitivity uh, are, are classic. And most of these patients are non-allergic. Uh, most of these patients present with late onset asthma. They're very hard to treat. Often they are needing oral steroids or even inhaled corticosteroids. Um, and about 10 to 15% of patients with severe asthma may have AERD. So don't underestimate this. So I think uh, that's something that we always ask about. But again, reported history of aspirin sensitivity may not be there and should not be something that you will rule out by, by just asking that question. Um, I think the treatment is, is a big challenge. Uh, often these patients may have polyps, although some of them may not have any polyposis. Now, why is it important? Well, it's important to keep in mind that patients with chronic rhinosinusitis with asthma or AERD, aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease, uh, are at a higher risk of being on oral, chronic oral steroids than patients with just chronic rhinosinusitis. Uh, with nasal polyps alone. So, uh, so it's important to know that having this comorbid asthma on top of this upper respiratory uh, uh, comorbidity increases the, uh, the uh, likelihood of, comorbid of, of poor quality of life, increases the risk of being on oral corticosteroids. So uh, I'm gonna uh, stop here and, and uh, I'm gonna 
uh, uh, maybe ask uh, Linda is, uh, and one of the questions that uh, always comes to mind, uh, and it, it'll be interesting to know what you do in the practice, Linda, with, with patients with upper airway disease and asthma. Do you tend to manage them yourself? Uh, do you have a multidisciplinary approach with your ENT colleagues um, or allergy colleagues? Uh, what, what do you usually do uh, when you face these patients? Yeah, I think in an ideal world, we're very fortunate here that we really do have a great interdisciplinary team for managing these patients. We work very closely with our ENT rhinology subspecialists who are really experts in managing the surgical management of uh, uh, polyp disease and are very enthusiastic about medical management for their patients, um, particularly after they uh, fail their first uh, first polyp surgery. Um, we also work very closely with allergists and laryngologists to deal with other comorbidities related to these patients. But this is really one of the most challenging ones and one of the areas where there's just been a lot of out, um, you know, uh, uh, movement in this field with the FDA approval of uh, biologics for their concomitant sinonasal disease as well as for their asthma. Um, so we like to really take that approach. And if you are out in the community, management of some of these patients can be some complex. complex. And so this um, may be a group of patients where it's good to refer them to a specialty program um, for multidisciplinary care. So Linda, how often do you order CT scans of the sinuses in that? such patients? What's your uh, threshold? It's funny that you ask that. Um, it's a little bit, it's evolved a little bit. I think, um, you know, I, I think in um, patients with high steroid dependency, um, I often will do that to look for polypoid disease. But I think you know, really CT becomes most useful when, um, you know, when surgery is being con contemplated. So I've really uh, taken more of an approach of referring them for endoscopic evaluation and really deferring CT, um, depending on what their endoscopic evaluation is, um, and just working on determination of indication of CT for the colleagues. But I think if I do have a patient with severe anosmia and really severe symptoms, um, um, and, you know, I will often um, order this before I send them off to my rhinology colleagues. So it's really decided on a case by case basis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm more, um, I have a lower threshold of, of, of asking for imaging, although I sometimes fail, uh, fail because the insurance, uh, just <laughs> like this morning, I had to do a peer to peer because, uh, you know, insurance company wanted to know why I'm requesting a CT sinus when I'm when I'm a pulmonologist. So I have to remind them I'm an asthma specialist and I treat the airway from up here to down here. To down there. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, I've, I found surprises because even though I do quick rhinoscopy, I'm not an ENT doc. I don't do laryngoscopy and go in the sinuses. And sometimes I, I miss uh, uh, diagnosis of nasal polyps. Uh, often these patients obviously have nasal obstruction uh, and, you know, I just treat them like I treat with allergic rhinitis with nasal steroids and leukotri modifier. This patient is on all these uh, and saline irrigation. Uh, but um, I, I think I'm as like you are, I, am, I have a much lower threshold if patient has failed surgery or told me had nasal surgery in the past and coming now with uncontrolled asthma, eosinophilia and nasal symptoms. I have a very low threshold of imaging and referring again to ENT. And actually we've been working very well with ENT docs uh, on these patients who fail surgery because they are very high risk of being controlled on oral steroids. And now we have other options that we can offer them, which are, is really unique uh, yes. and, and, uh, and important. Yeah. Well, very yes, well. I, I agree. It's very exciting. Mm -hmm. I mean, the response to some of these patients who, you know, historically have been very different, difficult to treat, you know, without having to resort to significant oral corticosteroid burden, um, you know, has been a very exciting time for those of us who have been around for a while. <laughs> Yes, I, I agree with you. Well, I think, Linda, you're going to be talking about oral steroids, just uh, as we mentioned it, uh, and, and chronic use of oral steroid in this difficult-to-treat asthma group. Uh, maybe you can uh, walk us through your case, and we'll have another discussion point uh, right after. Great. So let's move on. And so this is an area that's a real passion of mine, the care for the pace patient with oral corticosteroid 
uh, uh, either repeated uh, courses or chronic uh, daily oral corticosteroid use. Um, and so let's start with, again, uh, you know, a patient. And so this is a severe eosinophilic asthma patient um, uh, and a case that hopefully will illustrate some of the risks associated with both frequent short-term and chronic use of oral corticosteroids. And so this patient is a 56-year-old woman with a BMI of 29, a lifelong non-smoker who has had severe uh, uncontrolled asthma for 15 years now. Um, her asthma diagnosis um, uh, uh, was occurred following an ED visit and hospitalization where she had shortness of breath, um, wheezing, and required injectable steroid uh, medication and treatment for pneumonia. She's currently on a high-dose inhaled corticosteroid and long-acting beta agonist and had two other controller agents, both a leukotriene modifier and a long-acting muscarinic. A bronchodilator added fairly recently, but despite all of this, she's still using short-acting beta agonists uh, two nights per week and multiple times during each day with many triggers to her symptoms, again, including strong odors, smoke, and possibly cat dander. She has quite a few comorbid illnesses at this point after 15 years of this disease. She also has hypertension, diabetes, acid reflux, depression, and vitamin D deficiency. In your office, her asthma control test is still 15 out of 25 indicative of poor control despite this very high intensity therapy. You verify adherence and uh, proper inhaler technique in this patient. And despite all of this, she still has an exacerbation history with two exacerbations treated with oral corticosteroid bursts in the past year, um, one requiring a taper for three weeks. And she estimates that she's had five to 10 exacerbations in the past decade requiring ED visits and oral corticosteroid births. So this is a patient, while not oral corticosteroid dependent on a daily basis, has a, a fairly high oral corticosteroid burden, um, but maybe a patient who the degree and extent and consequences of her oral corticosteroid use may not be recognized in, in many practice settings. So let's talk about what some of those risks are. So before talking about what the risks are, let's talk about assessing this patient. So, you know, again, in this patient, uh, we did a biomarker assessment, and this patient has an absolute a blood eosinophil count of 450 cells per microliter. So she clearly has eosinophilic asthma. Her total IgE is 270, and she has uh, sensitivity to multiple allergens, including dust mites um, and cat, and she's a cat living in her home. Um, she also has an exhaled nitric oxide um, of 75 parts per billion, which is quite level over the upper uh, limit of 50, which is indicative of type 2 airway inflammation. And so obviously modifying her environment, if possible at all, would really be a priority in management of this case. Um, her lung function shows persistent airflow limitation with an FEV1 of 69% predicted and an FEV1 FEC ratio of 0.7, despite this high intensity therapy. Uh, lung volumes and gas transfer are normal, excluding other comorbid diseases, and her chest x-ray is normal with the exception of hyperinflation of her lungs. There are no consolidations. And so let's talk about what we mean by short and long-term oral corticosteroid use. And so short-term use is common for many patients with asthma. We often talk about this as a acute course or using a burst or treatment for an exacerbation, and it usually constitutes short-term exposure. And for patients with severe or difficult to treat asthma, about 46% to up to 92% of patients will require a short-term course over a one-year period. When we talk about long-term use, we're often talk about chronic users of oral corticosteroids. And sometimes we'll talk about this in terms of daily or continuous use, chronic or maintenance dose, or use of oral corticosteroids as a maintenance medication. In terms of patients with severe or uncontrolled asthma, long-term oral corticosteroid use can occur between 20 to 60% of patients, depending on the patient population study. Um, and in this uh, uh, a systematic review by Jean Bleeker earlier, uh, about a year ago, that pooled 139 observational studies, including over 21,000 patients, about 19% of these patients um, had severe asthma step four or five therapy. And uh, these data on frequency of intermittent versus long-term use um, comes out of this particular study, as we mentioned. So what are the adverse health effects of oral corticosteroids? Most of you are familiar with these. So just to reiterate some of the ones that you're all familiar with, there's association with cataracts, glaucoma, uh, 
the elevated blood pressure, hypertension, immunosuppression, ulcer disease, and musculoskeletal effects, including myopathy and uh, osteoporosis and fractures and osteonecrosis, uh, which is a, a catastrophic complication of oral corticosteroid use in these patients. Um, in children, we worry about developmental issues and growth retardation. Uh, patients are very concerned about skin effects, including striae, bruising, and cushing weight appearance. And there can be very significant endocrine um, issues, including onset of diabetes, uh, adrenal suppression and a development of permanent adrenal insufficiency. Um, and I, I really am paying much more attention to the psychiatric issues. Often these patients come to us and we, we list psychiatric illness as a comorbidity, but I've become increasingly sensitized to the causal effect of uh, steroids in many of these diseases. And oftentimes one of the most gratifying thing about use of biologicals in my practice is really much improved control of mental health issues in some of these patients who were really having either causative or exacerbation of underlying mental health issues from repeated steroid use. And repeat studies, including um, ones referenced here by Lou et al. and Mandel et al. and others by Price and Walji um, referenced here on this slide, have shown really uh, a doubling of increase of uh, fracture risk with even short-term oral corticosteroid use a threefold increase in risk of venous thromboembolism, which is something that I was not familiar with until review of some of these studies, and a fivefold increase of risk of sepsis, even with repeated courses of short-term oral corticosteroids. And so we all need to be responsible for better steroid stewardship in our practice and really asking about frequency of oral, both short-term and long-term oral corticosteroid use in our patients. Um, so what's the dose response effect? And so, you know, the highest doses, oral corticosteroid doses greater than seven to 15 milligrams per day of prednisolone or equivalent are really associated with the largest incidence of many of these complications that I already mentioned earlier. And so I, I won't repeat those. However, doses as low as a half to one milligram per day or even single bursts can have significant um, associations with adverse events. Annual cumulative cumulative oral corticosteroid doses um, of about 0.5 to one gram, which is equal to about four courses in a lifetime, um, are both indicative of poor asthma control and often are associated with many of these adverse events um, with a dose response effect. And sort of per GINA guidelines, maintenance oral corticosteroids really should now be avoided when other options are available to patients. And so although adding on a low dose of oral corticosteroid, less than 7.5 milligrams a day, may be effective and important for achieving short-term control in an unstable patient's um, this should be avoided whenever possible, and introduction of oral corticosteroid sparing therapy should be strongly considered when uh, um, available and when feasible. And obviously, implementing strategies to minimize dose should be um, uh, a priority, and other interventions to manage steroid-associated complications should be done in collaboration with other physicians taking care of these complex patients. Um, uh, I think I mentioned this already. This is uh, the GINA guidelines about uh, when to use oral corticosteroids. Um, but again, this has been downgraded again from what was considered uh, a first line or an alternate option to a lower tier option with evidence level D, um, predominantly because of the risk of substantial side effects. And the risk of side effects are really evidence level A at this point. And so again, uh, highlighting the importance of moving to a steroid sparing regimen whenever possible. Um, and this should be done again with shared decision making with our patients. And shared decision making is an approach to patient care, which um, we should all be doing um, when managing any chronic disease. But um, um, in this case, we're talking about the chronic disease as being asthma. And shared decision making is obviously really incorporating our patients and their priorities and preferences in our decisions. And this can be done um, more informally or can be done using decision aids, um, including one that's available um, in references quoting here and including decision aids available for severe asthma that are available through CHEST. And I encourage you to uh, go to the CHEST website and really try out the severe asthma shared decision-making tool that's present on that site. 
Shared decision-making has been shown to approve adherence outcomes and patient satisfaction with care. And we know that we all want those things and our institutions are mandating that we pay attention to these things and um, is really ethical, um, important from a perspective of um, ethics, uh, economics, and uh, uh, improved quality of care for our patients. So I'd like to sort of uh, summarize a couple of key points about caring for these oral corticosteroid burden, high burden patients. Um, and that management of severe asthma really involves an importance of being aware of the adverse effects, not only of long-term chronic oral corticosteroid daily use, which is something I think most of us are in tune with, but sometimes the, the burden and consequences of these frequent short-term courses is not recognized. And the data that I showed you really suggests that these repeated short term courses can really have adverse consequences for our patients. And so um, these short-term uh, consequences include risk of fracture, venous thromboembolism, and sepsis, and burdens of up to 0.5 to 1 grams cumulative can be associated even with increased risk of some of the long-term chronic outcomes that we discussed, including diabetes, osteoporosis, fractures, and cardiovascular and metabolic complications um, in these patients and that we should really consider the role of biologics in appropriate patients, keeping in mind that the efficacy and safety profiles of the individual agents. That's so great. Thank yeah, you so thank yeah, you. thank you. Thank you. So let me, let me uh, ask, I think sort of how, did, when you get patients who come into your practice who are really uh, using mm -hmm. repeated short courses or are on chronic oral corticosteroids really, um, you know, how do you approach the care of those patients in terms of identifying eligibility for steroid sparing therapies? And even more importantly, I think making sure we treat the whole patient and are really helping to prevent steroid associated complications. Uh, well, Linda, it's a challenge uh, for two reasons. One is the patient's perception. You know, every time they get sick, they get short term you know, either pulse steroids, as you mentioned, or short course, or if they're on chronic, we go up on their dose. So this perception that oral prednisone is the life saving for them is entrenched in some of our patients. So it takes time. And I'm glad you mentioned the shared decision making, because we have to really sit down and, and talk about it to the patient. Why are we worried about you taking these pills? Some patients, they understand very well. They don't wanna gain, continue to gain weight. They don't wanna have osteoporosis. They understand that prednisone is re or steroids are really bad for them, but others need education. When I identify somebody, I try to at least lower the dose to the lowest possible to maintain asthma control. I counsel the patient about other options. Some of, some of these options may he, he or she may qualify for. Uh, certainly, as I mentioned earlier, uh, um, even by Gina, uh, T2 inflammation, one of the uh, criteria for T2 inflammation is oral steroid dependence by itself. They really don't have to show all the other biomarkers, but certainly we look at them. So I think it's easier uh, to understand that there are, for the patient to understand that there are options that may allow me to cut down uh, the need for oral steroids. The second challenge I have is the, how fast should I go? Mm -hmm. and some of my patients are, are very intelligent and they cooperative and they know what to do with their oral steroids because they've been on them for a long time. I'm, I depend on them, so I give them the smaller portion of these uh, medication. I ask them to titrate it down very slowly as you, or as you probably do as well. Uh, and then if they feel bad, then they can go up on it. So I build up an action plan. Uh, but in general, I've been very successful, I would say, uh, in getting them off um, by educating them, by adding uh, therapies that are steroid sparing. Uh, and then by close follow-up, these patients need close follow-up because um, uh, you know, often they, they, they exacerbate while you're doing this. So you have to be very careful and very a uh, patient. And the patient has to be also give, give he, he or she has to give you their time and commitment that they will work with you and get it. I wonder what you do in, uh, in your practice that has been successful in getting yeah. people off. Yeah, I agree with you. My my experience matches up with you where these patient, patients fit into two buckets. Well, 
One of them is the group that seeks you out because they really um, want, want to avoid or corticosteroids and they're concerned about the health effects. And uh, that's a little less challenging than the patient group who have just become really acclimated to this and incorporated the need for these, um, you know, uh, 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 life-saving drugs, but drugs with severe side effects into their life. And, um, but, uh, you know, I, I found that, um, you know, oftentimes the ones that are less concerned are really less concerned because they're not aware of the risk of complications. They think they're on low dose, or they think that a couple of bursts a year are normal for having asthma. Um, and so, again, with conversation and a relationship and shared decision making, I really, um, you know, I share the data that we uh, just presented to our audience with them, and many of them are shocked to understand the, co the potential consequences or the consequences that are, have already happened to them and are not aware of the relationship, and that improves their um, adherence with the plan. I think um, the use of biological therapies has really been um, really amazing in, in reducing steroid burden in these patients, and, um, and that potential is very appealing for many of my patients. I, I see a lot of the steroid-dependent patients monthly in terms of tapering them. Um, we are very sort of vigilant like you are of giving them a plan of uh, what criteria to stop their taper. We also talk to them about symptoms and signs of adrenal insufficiency, which we have to be careful about um, for patients who've been on long-term oral corticosteroids. And um, we also really work with a lot of uh, uh, you know, other specialists in terms of managing the complications of our, their disease, their primary care doctors in terms of, you know, adjusting their diabetes medicines as they come off of steroids and uh, endocrinologists for assessment uh, for preventative therapy for osteoporosis and fractures and our ophthalmology mm -hmm. colleagues. And so it really takes a, a village to take care of these patients. And, um, uh, you know, sometimes that village is, is obvious or sometimes you have to develop that village, but um, it's really gratifying when um, you can, um, patients come off their diabetes medicines or when they lose 20 pounds or when they've not used steroids in a year and not had an exacerbation, which is, are things that we sometimes achieve with some of our new mm -hmm. therapies and is really one of the things I enjoy the most about what I do. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Now, uh, very important points that you're bringing up. One of the things that we also are reaching out to is our primary care colleagues. Uh, even though patients don't know because, you know, they're not physicians, they haven't been updated on the literature, but even some of my colleagues in primary care uh, think maybe it's okay to give short-term steroids twice a year for patients. And I think GINA and other guidelines for asthma are very adamant based on evidence, obviously, that somebody who has or requires two or more courses of oral steroids deserves to be seen by a specialist because there's something wrong with their asthma management. It is not okay for people to get uh, more than two courses of, or even one, I would say, courses of oral steroids, because not only that it is associated with comorbidities, but it does put that patient at high risk of future exacerbations. So I think that's something that that message needs to come out to all primary care colleagues out there, including pediatricians. Obviously, they see lots of kids. And, you know, at one time, not now, but an old study showed that our pediatric colleagues tend to be the highest prescriber of systemic steroids among all physicians. Hope things have changed now. But that's another important point. Very good. We're, we're running short of time. I'm going to summarize that uh, this has been a really very important discussion, uh, at least for me. And uh, thank you, Linda, for participating. But let me uh, put this uh, in the context. What we have talked about today is we talked about how our thinking about asthma has changed in the year 2021 moving forward. We know that asthma has multiple phenotypes and even endotypes. Use of biomarkers such as blood eosinophil has allowed us to identify subtypes of asthma. We spent quite a bit of time talking about one subtype of asthma here, and that's severe eosinophilic asthma, which is characterized by persistent eosinophilia, uh, usually in the periphery, but also in the airways. These elevated eosinophils put the patients at high risk of exacerbation, poor asthma control, and increased risk of hospitalization. I also mentioned in my second case that asthma by itself, severe asthma, but also severe asthma with eosinophilic asthma does not usually exist by itself and often is associated with our other comorbid illnesses, which both include respiratory and non-respiratory, and is often 
managed by systemic steroids, which have long and short-term consequences. It's clear that uh, GINA and other asthma guidelines suggest a phenotypic approach to asthma, especially severe disease. Use of biomarkers and clinical presentation may help identify these patients. Certainly these patients with severe asthma, step five and, and four and five, need to be seen or assessed by a specialist uh, if needed uh, for, for better asthma control and management. And very important, let's not forget that managing severe asthma is not a one-time deal. It's a continuous cycle of assessment, reassessment, and redefining or redesigning therapy. I think it's important for a patient with severe asthma to understand that there is a partnership that we need to build with him or her. And I think a shared decision-making when it comes to management is very important. After all, they are the ones who are gonna be implementing the management strategies that you are gonna be prescribing. So therefore it's very important right up front to have this agreement with them uh, that we will get you better, you need to work with us, we will listen to you, and this is what we are planning and listen to the other side and try to implement uh, something that is agreeable for both. I hope this uh, program is gonna be helpful for you in the clinical practice. Uh, I'd like to thank again, uh, Dr. Linda Rogers for uh, taking some of her time and, and, and co-moderating this with me. I also would like to thank Chest for the opportunity uh, to present these data and this information to you. And also thank GSK for sponsoring this program. Have a great day.